Uh, I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited to be with Ebony and Jason, and I think that this is going to be a great conversation. One of the things I'm excited about is that they really come from this issue from two different perspectives, and I think that's going to give us a chance to do some really rich stuff. Um, you know, as a politics supporter, once a bill is passed, we usually pass it along to these policy folks, and uh, that can oftentimes cause a lot of information to get lost. But for a bill as large as the Inflation Reduction Act, the hard work has really just begun. And the $400 billion, the $400 billion that's been set aside has been tied up in a lot of different ways, and we really want to focus on that. So I'm going to start with Ebony here. When we think about the IRA and what came down from Washington, let's start with the scope. Was it enough? Well, first of all, thank you for having me and really excited to get into this conversation. I think we all are here because we know and uh, want to have a community and environment that has clean air, clean water, and we want an environment where we are able to thrive and to be our best. And the Inflation Reduction Act responding to the climate crisis, of course, it has many nuances in it that can in certain ways help and has helped. We know that we need to speed up uh, infrastructure for clean and renewable energy. We know that we need to make investments in communities that have been harmed by the climate crisis. And all of those things are great. However, there were also portions of the Inflation Reduction Act that incentivize the oil and gas industry. Mm -hmm. And we know the oil and gas industry is the number one driver of this climate crisis. And so when there are things in the, uh, the entire package that actually work against what the package was supposed to deliver, it's like we're drilling holes in one end and bailing water out on the other end. Mm. So was it a great start in so many ways? Yes. Do we have a lot more work to do? Absolutely. And the one thing that we need to do and what I would have wanted to see in that is not public leasing of lands for oil and gas drilling because that's still polluting the air and it's still putting specific communities, black and brown communities that look at like me at risk. Mm -hmm. So we're on the right path, but there are things that need to be done to address still historical injustices, especially environmental injustices. And there are still things that we need to do. At this point, we are in a crisis, a crisis. Mm -hmm. We have 100-year floods occurring every year, uh, every five years now. So there's a lot more that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Well, I hear it's two steps forward, maybe a step back uh, in that legislation. What do you say, Jason, and also specifically on the question of implementation, how do we make sure that money actually finds its way to communities? Well, thank you, Ested. And um, you know, it would be nice to have some quality time in the green room, so I think we are going to really yeah. be able to engage what I think some really constructive tensions. The you know, fundamental value of the Inflation Reduction Act is that it finally created a climate strategy for this country. And it's a climate strategy that is based on innovation and investment, and I think really kind of has the potential to generate the durable policy that we need. It's working, right? Just in the last 12 months, over $270 billion have been invested in clean energy technology. It's as much as the last eight years combined. Mm -hmm. I think the place where you know, we have to really think about things there is it's changed a lot. Right? The clean energy industry is fundamentally different than it was 10 years ago, which is great news because now we are actually operating at scale. This is not a quaint little idea that makes people feel good while 99% of their power is coming from oil and gas. This is a big time industry now. As a big time industry, we are now confronting a lot of the same challenges that other massive industries confront. And just to kind of engage around oil and gas, I think first the good news is the vast majority of resources in that legislation was promoting renewable power. At least two thirds of the renewable power being built in this country right now is being built by companies that have oil and gas assets. Right, so this idea that there used to be good clean energy, bad fossil energy, and you could kind of fight against one while embracing the other. It's just not the way the world works right now. The lines aren't that clear anymore. Well, and look, the good, there's good news and bad news, right? The good news is this is where the balance sheets are, right? These are the companies that can plausibly build enough clean energy to actually avoid the worst effects of the climate crisis. But it's not so simple anymore. Mm -hmm. um, 
Can we get to, but the, to the question of implementation? What's the biggest challenge is to actually make sure oh. we see that effect? So, the sorry, that, effect. so look, the, the future is very bright and every day is a freaking crisis. Um, <laughs> we have, again, run into the real problems we need to run into. And just to kind of name the top ones, transmission, transmission, transmission. It's not really very cool to have you know, clean energy plants if you can't put the power where it's needed. And we need to probably quadruple the amount of transmission. Very hard to cite what they call linear infrastructure. Huge challenge. Permitting, this is a place where I know we probably have some different ideas. We're just running out of time, right? The scarcest kind of commodity we have in the climate crisis is time. It took 18 years to cite the Sunzia transmission line, which is bringing clean power from Arizona and Mexico to California. If, if we, you know, we can hit net zero by 2087, but if we want to do it by 2050, we've got to rethink that. And then the last two, supply chain is tough, right? A lot of the, particularly solar industry, is controlled by Chinese companies. And so we can't trade reliance on Saudi Arabian oil for reliance on you know, Chinese solar panels. That's a big problem. People want it to be over tomorrow. We spent 20 years shipping it all to China. It's not going to come back in 20 weeks. And then lastly, the biggest, greatest problem we have is workforce. We need to hire about a million people, which is like, hallelujah. Like, that's, that's the durability of this industry. But we've got to hire a million people. And there's nothing like the workforce pipeline and training to make that happen. We have companies right now that cannot find the workers to operate the current plants. Mm -hmm. To the point that Jason's making about the urgency um, that's needed, the, the kind of, you know, the, the time problem here. How do you balance that with, with the values I know you all hold about community engagement and really making sure the folks on the ground are leading that conversation? It seems like those things could be in conflict a little. They're often in conflict. And usually when we're rushing to make urgent decisions, certain communities are left out. Yep. And so one of the great parts of our democracy is it's supposed to be engaging and every uh, policy or every law that's passed. There needs to be community engagement. And we didn't quite see that at the scale we needed to see with the IRA. Mm -hmm. For instance, the Justy for is 40. They did not weigh in. Mm -hmm. So looking at some of the uh, implementation plans, there was no community engagement. And then also, there was money, I think, 40% was actually supposed to go back to communities that were harmed. Mm -hmm. Now, it was only 16% in the IRA. So we often get caught up in the cycle of trying to move things fast. However, if you want to go further, you have to go together, and that often takes time. Mm -hmm. And when we don't take the time to engage certain communities, then we have different, we, we just perpetuate harm and injustice. Right, the same folks who were hurt then are hurt again. Yes. Mm -hmm. and so, we that. Go ahead. Look, environmental racism, pernicious, absolutely real, a trauma that we have to engage. At the same time, understand what's really the key for this industry. 80% of the renewable power is being built in rural Republican districts. Yeah. Right? I mean, the issues that we have as an industry are very few in kind of a you know, classic EJ standpoint. It is arguments about you know, the impact on farmland and vistas. And so that's a, just a real question. We're also finding that processes that were designed ineffectively to slow things down, right, to protect communities from what people perceive to be you know, health impactful fossil energy, are now slowing down the future. And so it is not in disadvantaged communities' interest to also be deprived of the economic vitality. I mean, I think it is fair to consider the National Environmental Policy Act a fossil fuel subsidy, right? Let's, if we can't, let's lock it in. Let's, as lo the longer we take, the longer we're taking to actually enable the transition. So our companies aren't the best at it. They're trying really hard to do things. They've, they've learned. You got to go in early. You got to deal with the people. Mm -hmm. But these are weaponizable processes. Mm -hmm. You can have five county commissioners with relationships that are you know, more based on the kind of ideology of you know, woke power shutting things down. And so just you know, we can't have the private interests so much interrupt the public good. To that point about, go ahead. Can, can I just? I think we often talk about perception, and we often uh, we often use people's livelihoods as bargaining chips. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, 
we have a responsibility, a moral responsibility to ensure that people's health and their well-being is protected. And if that takes time to ensure that communities that have been systemically harmed, then we need to take that. And I, I, I don't see it as slowing things down to ensure that a law does not uh, harm a certain community mm -hmm. or that a law does not, um, usually when these infrastructures are being built, when we don't do a proper assessment, we see biodiversity loss, we see economic burdens, we also see pollution, co-pollution. And all of the green renewable energy does not address that. And these are still areas that continue to be swept under the rug, which still perpetuate harm. So if it takes time to figure it out, we need to do that so that communities aren't put in harm's way. So look, this is where I adore this woman, but we just, we just disagree about this. Yeah, right? I guess I'm, I want to ask about what I think you're, what I hear from you is that like, is that minimizing the kind of long-term urgency, but look, right? Like, I mean, I, cause it does feel as if- Disadvantaged, you know, traumatized communities are going to be the communities that suffer from the worst effects of climate change. They are the communities with the least capacity to create resilience, the least capacity to move. And so again, it, we just gotta figure this out because also they're the communities with the highest asthma rates and the most kind of highest lead. Mm -hmm. you know, do you really wanna slow down the national transition to get rid of those emissions and to make the transition to save the planet? Like, I don't. Well, I guess I wanna ask about how we also make that transition sustainable. To your point, you mentioned how so much of this is happening in rural communities and red states, kind of distinct from, I think, the places we typically associate with kind of like uh, uh, climate action. Has there been enough buy-in from those places so that, so that when we think about the IRA, we're not, you know, I've heard Republicans talk about rollbacks, right? And so is that buy-in across ideological and is that sustainable? Not yet. No. So just to run the arc of this, right? Innovation and investment was always the premise of the more conservative approach to climate change, right? Progressives wanted regulation and taxation. Conservatives wanted innovation and incentives and investment. That's what the IRA is. 80% of the benefits are going to traditionally conservative communities if you think about the jobs associated. But it was done in the also awful partisan reconciliation process, right? So this part of the law that actually had considerable historical Republican value and support got into this toxic us versus you problem where only Democrats were involved in that legislation. So we have this valley of risk. Those few years while the intense opposition to the process is still very hot mm -hmm. and we haven't achieved all those benefits yet. But if we can hang in there, which I think we will for a couple of years, that will change. Mm -hmm. The first part of your question though on how we doing in rural America, like we have a huge hearts and minds issue, right? We're not being greeted as saviors. You know, we have a tremendous obligation to be working with rural communities. I, Ebony, I got a hearts and minds issue with the ENGOs, right? I mean, the environmental community is not as aligned with this transition as we think we need it to be. So we got a lot of work to do. And wait, and the why in that is because of the, the urgency kind of tension? You, you should disagree with this, but you know, <laughs> having spent some good time you know, wearing Birkenstocks 30 years ago, uh, the you know, E.F. Schumacher, Small is Beautiful, Aldo Leopold, right, the, the ethos of a lot of environmentalism is community-driven, small is beautiful. That is not the climate solution, and that's a tension. You know, I mean, there's not, a, there's not a right or wrong, but it's a tension. To the hearts and minds question, you know, Greenpeace, as you mentioned, does a lot of that work in community engagement. Is it doing that same engaging of those rural communities, of those red, uh, uh, in those red districts through our, that are experiencing or they're getting the money from the IRA? So who we engage with are those who are on the front lines and who are most impacted, black and brown communities. That's the focus. And, yes, mm -hmm. and often the investments in our communities, we are promised the world, but the investments don't actually show up. And when the investments do show up, they are weaponized against us. And we have, in this country, an overwhelming majority, as you said, of black and brown children suffering from asthma, suffering from cancer. You can look outside of your window in certain communities and see oil wells drilling. And those are not in rural communities. Mm -hmm. They are concentrated in our communities. 
Why? Because processes have not been in place to push back against the, the historical environmental harms that have been done uh, perpetuated on us. So when we have NGOs and put in a light that we are only concerned about um, trees or not actually looking at the human impacts, that, that's a problem. And we know that we need clean and renewable energy. And so it shouldn't be a dichotomy where we're, we're pitted against each other. There's a role for investment in, in infrastructure of green and renewable energy. And there's also a role for ensuring that environmental harms are not perpetuated. And so those things do need to work in sync. Do you see, do you, have you seen any kind of bright spots in the environmental justice or racism uh, uh, like push back in the last 10 years? I mean, if the IRA represents a new moment for America and its kind of investment around this stuff, have you seen any of it kind of trickle down to the protections of those communities that you're focused on? Not at the scale that it should be. Definitely not at the scale. And when we really think about it, the continuation of the harm and the administration's promise that they would invest in our communities and then to hear that 80, 80 acres were given, 80 million acres actually, for oil and gas sold. And we know where those mm -hmm. infrastructures and those projects will go. They will go in our communities. And so, no, it's not trickling down. We are still being put in sacrifice zones at the expense of profits in this country, whether it's through renewable profits or whether it's through oil and gas. It still seems as if black and brown lives and what, our, um, what, what we offer to this, co this country mm -hmm. is still put at, ex uh, we're still used as bargaining chips. And at that point, at this point, it's not acceptable. You mentioned kind of in the back that you see the IRA as kind of a metaphor for this new moment. In your view, what's defining the, the, the kind of new era we're in in American climate policy? So look, the, the poetry of it is um, a facility I'm gonna go out to see in mid-October, which closed down a coal plant, replaced it with solar power, used the existing infrastructure. You know, I mean, like that's, you know, that's the magic. Um, it's really about speed and scale. I mean, look, what I, what I worry about is 27 years, right? We wanna transition the entire domestic economy to an engine that is clean in 27 years. We wanna be inventing technologies that we can spend out to the rest of the world. Um, you know, that's where the anxiety is. But I will tell you, our members are desperate for talent and they wanna find it in every community. And the jobs that are gonna really exist in black and brown communities are manufacturing jobs which are pretty good jobs. They are having a hard time, right? They are having a hard time finding workers. They're having a hard time training workers. And like, this is where you know, Emily and I got to team up because we absolutely agree. It's a you know, crisis that requires solving. Mm -hmm. Do you see those opportunities? I mean, like I see, a, I see you laying out a, a, a kind of vessel to be filled, right? Do you, do you, do you think, do you have hope? It's kind of, it's kind of, I hate when people ask me hope questions, but I'm kind of throwing it to you. Do you see that as an opportunity that will be realized? I think it has to be realized if we're going to combat the climate crisis. And I mean, we see it even with the UAW and the, and the workers now on strike mm -hmm. that are demanding that the jobs for, renewal, uh, for electric cars are unionized. So there has to be a partnership. There has to way, be a way that we manage even a just transition for workers who are involved in the fossil fuel industry now. Yes, <laughs> that, that deserves a clap. <laughs> So there, there, has to, there has to be a partnership. And I think through time, we'll start to realize that when we don't pit each other against each other, there's, we need clean, renewable energy. And so we, we have to work to make sure that it's um, proliferated throughout the country. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope that uh, maybe this is the start of a nice little partnership here. Thank you all so much for your time and uh, for listening to this conversation.